Coming up this week, Claude can now create and edit your spreadsheets, PowerPoints, Google Docs, and more. Replit's impressive new AI agent can work autonomously for 200 minutes, but is it really more productive? ChatGPT gets a new feature that lets you branch your conversations in different directions, and a creepy new tool that lets you speak to your colleagues without ever moving your lips. Stay tuned for all of that and more, and if you enjoy the briefing, hit the subscribe and the like button. So first up this week, Anthropics Claude can now create and edit Excel spreadsheets, Google Docs, PowerPoint slides, PDFs, and more. So instead of receiving text-only responses or artifacts, you can now ask Claude to actually create the files that you need. Anthropic says that some of the most powerful ways to use this new feature include creating polished looking charts, spreadsheets and presentations. And the demos so far actually look pretty impressive. So here's a selection of examples of this in action for tasks including writing a resume, building a financial model of Google from scratch, creating a PDF slide deck and writing a technical design document. As impressive as these capabilities are, if you take a closer look at some of these examples, as one user pointed out, the new tools aren't immune to hallucinations, something to bear in mind if you do rely on the output of these tools. The new feature sees it edge one step closer to pitting itself directly against incumbents like Google and Microsoft. And this week, Microsoft seemed to be pretty impressed with the output of Anthropic's models. Microsoft is reported to be continuing its conscious uncoupling from OpenAI by using some of Anthropic's models to power some of its Copilot products. This new report references comments made by a Microsoft exec where they admit that Claude's Opus models actually outperform GPT-5. Microsoft says that 100 million users now use at least one Copilot product, and Office 365 is on track to generate over $1 billion. So if Anthropic was to capture some of that market, they may themselves be edging closer to their most recent $100 billion valuation. And if you're curious about some of the tactics that technical leaders are using to drive AI adoption internally, then check out this week's deep dive over on Substack. In this piece, I share some practical real-world tactics that top companies including Uber, Stripe, Duolingo, OpenAI and others are using to drive and manage AI adoption internally. Tactics include appointing internal champions and rotational programs, hackathons to encourage experimentation, and two-hour weekly AI time blocks to allow teams to finesse their AI skills. So if you're curious about how top companies are creating an AI-first culture, then check out this week's deep dive. And speaking of OpenAI, this week they revealed a new feature that was inspired by one of Microsoft's own products, GitHub. ChatGPT unveiled a small but powerful new feature for web users called branching. So branching is a concept that obviously draws inspiration from Git branches, but in the context of AI chats, it lets you break up your conversation into multiple different threads, depending on the different types of tangents that you want to go down. So for product development teams, this could be particularly helpful for conversations where you want to explore ideas or hypothetical strategic bets without necessarily committing to any one specific path. And if you're a fan of visualizing these types of conversations, then AI diagram generation tool Napkin has this week launched a new set of mind map templates. This new set includes new formats, orientations, and new editing capabilities. So check that one out if you're a fan of visualizing your thought process. Elsewhere this week, Replit has unveiled an impressive new AI agent called Agent 3 that could transform the product development process. According to Replit, Agent 3 runs on its own for up to 200 minutes, handling full tasks autonomously, and it uses a proprietary new testing kit, which means that Agent 3 will periodically test the app that it's building using a browser, and then generating a report on all the issues it finds before attempting to fix them. Replit's CEO says that this proprietary testing system is three times faster and 10 times more cost-effective than the state-of-the-art computer use models. It also has the ability to create sub-agents who can pick up specific tasks that are delegated to it. Now, it's only been a day since this was announced, but so far, real-world feedback is pretty positive. One developer who got early access and built an SEO agent out of it says that it is the beginning of a new era of autonomy, but others are a little more skeptical. In this example, the agent struggled to build and test a version of Google Authentication spending at least 40 minutes of it. The result was an additional $75 over the plan, which led him to conclude that Agent 3 may 10x Replit's revenue, but not necessarily productivity. Meanwhile, Google's AI product teams gave us three new updates this week. The first is an update to Notebook LM, which saw it update its reports feature to include new formats. Now, if you've not used reports before, it's essentially a way to generate documentation from the sources that you upload into Notebook LM. 
Notebook LM will now dy dynamically suggest the relevant reports based on all of the sources that you upload. And for product teams, some of the suggested reports that may be of interest include market analysis documentation and strategy papers. As well as this, VO3 can now shoot vertical videos, which makes it super useful for social media videos. And Google shipped what it says is its most requested feature in Gemini, which is the ability to upload audio files into Gemini chats. Now let's take a look at some tools you can use, and we'll start with a product called Interpret. An Interpret is designed to turn your user feedback into actionable customer intelligence. So this tool is used by product teams at companies including Canva, Notion, and Perplexity, and it essentially allows you to consolidate all of your different sources of product feedback and then make product decisions based on that feedback. Rather than reading through hundreds of different tickets, you can simply ask Interpret specific questions about the feedback that you're getting from customers and then get summarized responses from all of your different channels. So if you're looking for new ways to manage customer feedback, then Interpret could be worth a look. The next product is something called Bitrig, and this is a recent Y Combinator product. And this is vibe coding with a difference. So rather than using the traditional web browser to create a web app, this lets you build apps for your phone on your phone. So you can essentially use a conversational interface as you typically would on the web, but the output this time is a mobile app. It's built upon Swift and Swift UI, and it even allows you to do things like build features that include notifications and home screen widgets. So if you're someone who has experimented with web-based vibe coding, but now want to build some prototypes of mobile apps, then Bitrig could be worth a look. And the final product for this week is something called CoFounder. This is designed to be a simple one-stop destination where you can connect all of the tools that you currently use. So things like Notion, Google Docs, Slack, Linear, and others, and, and then get customized updates and queries from those tools. Some of the examples that they share on their website include getting status updates from Linear and then posting those into your Notion docs. Recently, they released what they call a state-of-the-art memory feature, which is designed for long horizons across weeks and months, not just single sessions. So the more you use CoFounder, the more it remembers information from each of your knowledge sources and ultimately becomes more useful thanks to its personalization. Now let's move on to some data and trends for the week. And we'll start with a new study, which shows that senior engineers are shipping more AI generated code than junior engineers. Now this may not be surprising to folks who are working in tech, but according to a new survey, 32% of senior developers with over 10 years experience say over half of their code shipped is now AI generated versus just 13% for junior developers. And this week, AI coding startup Cognition announced that it is now being valued at a massive $10 billion after raising another $400 million in funding. The CEO of the parent company of products like Devin and Windsurf said that in code especially, AI has really, really taken off and all of the best software engineers have really changed their workflows. Cognition's annual recurring revenue grew from $1 million in 2024 to $73 million in June 2025. But the question on everyone's lips is how long will this trajectory last? With Anthropic inflating its own valuation to over $100 billion, there are genuine fears that we are experiencing an AI bubble. In the latest Department of Product poll this week, I asked you what percentage of code do you think will be AI generated within the next year? And almost 60% of respondents said that between 70% and 100% of code will be AI generated in the future. Let me know in the comments below if you think that we're living in an AI bubble. Elsewhere this week, despite Microsoft critiquing OpenAI's new GPT-5 model, Zendesk says that adopting GPT-5 has led to a 95% reliability rate on standard procedures, with a 30% reduction in large flows. Agents powered by GPT-5, they say, can solve more than 50% of tickets for most customers, and in some cases, 80 to 90%. And the use of AI in the workplace seems to be split depending on the type of person who's using it. In the latest Morgan Stanley intern survey, 96% of interns at Morgan Stanley say that they're using AI tools, with ChatGPT the most popular. So you can see in this graph that ChatGPT is the most popular versus products like Claude Perplexity and others. But I guess in one sense, these users aren't really corporate users until they graduate and become real-world corporate workers. But the use of AI seems to have dropped across American businesses in general, with the percentage of companies saying that they use AI for producing goods and services dropping from 15% in June down to 11% by the end of August. Now, this question was a very specific question, which asked respondents whether they were using AI to produce goods and services. And the cohort that has dropped is the cohort of companies with greater than 250 employees, as you can see in this graph. 
And this seems to reflect other studies which show that there is a degree of skepticism now about the efficacy of AI in a corporate setting. With AI prone to hallucinations, for larger companies in particular, relying on AI to produce goods and services, which is the question that they asked in this survey, may just be too risky given the current state of technology. OpenAI is doing its best to solve this problem of hallucinations, and this week it published a new research paper called Why Language Models Hallucinate. The paper argues that hallucinations stem from how LLMs are trained and evaluated, with current systems rewarding models for guessing, often confidently, rather than admitting uncertainty with responses like, I don't know. The paper argues that rather than punishing abstention, i.e. refusing to answer when a model is unsure, evaluation frameworks should reward models for withholding guesses on certain queries. And finally this week, if you ever get tired of the sound of your own voice, a new device called Alter Ego may be exactly what you're looking for. This is a bizarre new device that reads the subtle internal movements of your mouth to translate what you say and then convey the message back to another person who's also wearing the device. So in this demo, you can see two people with the headset on conversing with each other without ever moving their mouth. Now I can see how this technology could be super helpful for communicating with other people in different languages, but for folks who speak the same language, do you really want to meet up with friends and awkwardly stare at each other in the face as you read each other's thoughts? Let me know in the comments below. And on that note, I'll leave it there for this week. Thanks very much for listening and watching. I'll be back next week with another briefing.